many greetings, faithful viewers. HCRG here. Welcome to what I like to call my Treasure 3 of a Kind. As you're already aware, Treasure is a game development company based in Tokyo, founded by former Konami employees in the summer of 92, namely Masato Mayagawa, Hideyuki Suganami, aka Nami, Hiroshi Iuchi, Mitsuru Yaida, Tetsuhiko Kikuchi, aka Han, and of course Norio Hanzawa, the latter of who's the composer for almost every other Treasure game. Yes, the same guy responsible for the Korth Arcade soundtrack, amongst various other Konami greats. Anyways, Treasure was widely known for classic-style action games, as well as various differentiating genres that have built upon innovative gameplay systems. Their most notable titles, if somehow obscure, included McDonald's Treasure Land Adventure, released the same year as the first choice I'm about to dive into, Yu Yu Hakusho Makio Toisen, Alien Soldier, released only in Japan and Europe, except maybe here via the Sega Channel, Radiant Silver Gun and Ikaruga, Mischief Makers, Stretch Panic, Astro Boy Omega Factor and other licenses, and even Gradius V. History aside, first and foremost, we're diving into what I like to call the Junior Contra, Gunstar Heroes, released in 1993. <laughs> Storyline-wise, despite bearing regional differences, both the Japanese and Western versions revolve around a godlike artificial being, Gold and Silver, and the four main gems necessary for his activation, the latter of which are stolen and hidden by the Nefarious Empire, led by General Grey and his right-hand man Colonel Red, aka Smash Daisaku, who, as we're all aware of by now, resembles M. Bison. Seriously, let's just get it out of our fucking system! Now, it's up to the efforts of two twin brothers, Red and Blue, to thwart their ambitions, including those of their older amnesiac pilot sibling, Green, recently brainwashed by the aforementioned Empire, no less, and recover each and every gem in order to restore peace to Gunstar 9, otherwise known as <clears throat> the Earth, at any cost and by any means necessary. Now, in terms of gameplay, being a hell of a lot more than just your standard run and gun, Contra and Metal Slug much? The Crusade ensues upon not only picking between two gunfire skill set types, free or fixed, where your character either fires in every available direction while on the move or stationed, respectively. One of four main weapons, all of which can also be procured in-game and can be fused and or doubled with the other, along for much improved ammo proficiency, no less. First, there's Force, your standard rapid-fire machine gun, Lightning, a straight laser volley, Chaser, composed of a volley of triangular projectiles that home in on your foes, and finally, your Flame, or an effective close-range flamethrower. And to top it all off, one of your four main desired mandatory operations, all of which can be carried out in any desired order. Mega Man anyone? Upon commencement of your mission, you're constantly stuffing the ever-loving shit out of every Rogue Empire soldier at every turn, and occasionally phantoms, which drop health for you, complete with occasional mini-boss and main-boss confrontations in between and at the end, respectively. Hell, you can even grab and toss your foes left and right, not to mention your own freaking partner in two-player mode, minus the damage. Perform various maneuvers including sliding, again similar to Mega Man, skidding at long ranges, mid-air belly flops and jump kicks, and the like. Buttons A, B, and or C, depending on your personal preferences, allows your Gunstar Troop to fire off his weapon, jump, and or swap between the two desired weapons, thus enabling or disabling both or one of them at a time. And before I forget, blocking is performed by holding up in conjunction with your preferred jumping and firing key simultaneously, though it's deemed rather useless despite your character being exposed to only one damage point. In true Metroid fashion, you've got a life counter starting at a possible 100 HP, which can be replenished at any time by obtaining hearts, aside from the aforementioned main weapons, and is increased by 20 every time you clear an area. As your character endures damage, that counter goes down by the numbers, and I do mean by the fucking numbers, and a seizure-inducing red flash will signal that he's close to his demise. In other words, he's in super deep shit. Should said counter reach zero, an instant death ensues, resulting in the game giving you the choice to continue on sallying forth or end the adventure altogether. Deciding on the former will cause you to start either A at the beginning or B at a specific checkpoint throughout. Take note, your supplied infinite continues, despite your overall score being reset to fuck all. In other words, the more the merrier. As far as this game's mission itinerary, you're exploring the ancient ruins while, in the long run, rescuing the natives from the Empire Army and thwarting the efforts of Pink and her cohorts, riding in a magnetic minecart underground, leading up to an epic as shit confrontation with Green and his volatile Beyond Belief 7 Force mechanism that takes on the form of various creatures and weapons, infiltrating their flying battleship and even their attack chopper, complete with face to face showdowns with the Empire Army heavies, the earlier recounted Colonel Red, aka Smash Daisaku, that very same obvious Bison wannabe! Who's gonna feel it? 
and the buff yet resilient Orange, aka whom I like to call the bastard child of Mike Hager from Final Fight, and Colonel Shikishima from Akira, and even infiltrating the base of a gambler known as Black, thus participating in a board game themed Void of a Maze, which he also helms prior to reaching his stingy ass, where each random challenge awaits you upon landing on a specific square after rolling the giant dice, all of which, in addition to skyrocketing replayability, will keep you on your toes through and through, no matter how far you roam. Not only that, there's even more running gun mayhem, complete with an unexpected plot twist or two, followed by a shmup-oriented stage that takes place after clearing the first floor, in which, if you're playing two-player mode, the satellite cannon and ship are controlled separately. Crisis Force much? Thus applying a diverse change in gameplay like never before. Vice Project Doom, anyone? And finally, back to the same old you-know-what. Control mechanics-wise, they're nothing short, and I mean nothing short, of spot-on, sharp, and compliant, albeit a trifle jarring, thanks to their prevention from strategy misjudgments, whether intentional or not, and all but make up for cases like these, depending on the required level of patience and time to grasp and accustom oneself with them, and the diverse Beyond Logic gameplay definitely won't leave you in any extent of disappointment, that's for sure. Though Gunstar Heroes might not be on the same wavelength as the Contra series, concerning its challenge, of course, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph isn't right up there, at least at certain intervals. Getting back to the boss confrontations, which, for the record, are this game's highlight, let's just say that they'll keep your senses fluctuating at the most dramatic rates imaginable, and will tempt you in more ways than once a butcher controller in a trillion fragments, if an infinitesimal is a beetle's nuts, shit if it had any. Bottom line, you'll need each and every reliant strategic miracle to pull out at even the most desperate and critical times of necessity, for instance, rapid effect of firepower, high-speed evasion tactics, enemy pattern memorization, the works. Take note that they also possess the most gargantuan vitality counters, like you do, which, depending on the damage you inflict from your desired single weapon, or fused hybrid of two weapons, can decrease rapidly or gradually. And bear in mind the infinite continue benefit offered every time your troop gets a case of the infamous red ass, thus forcing him to start at one of the two aforementioned possible stage spots. Graphically, for Treasure's first-ever breakthrough concept, the visuals are grandiose beyond comprehension and are adequately exemplified for its time, while the main opposing characters sport an anime-inspired style, which personally, for the record, is definitely up my alley. The use of multiple sprites and fast-paced brain-melting effects in each area is where it all shines. They'll either keep the action and intensity going non-stop, or plague the experience with slowdown, but mostly due, as expected, to the console's limitations. But all in all, don't disappoint a single inkling, neither do the contradictory choice of backgrounds. In True Link's Awakening fashion, there's some eccentric moments which we'll be seeing lots of in Treasure's other titles, for the sake of occasional mood balances, of course. And must I mention that their logo was animated using an early 3D polygonal effect? You can tell right away that this indestructible Konami spin-off developer was not fucking around in this particular department. Likewise with, yep, you guessed it, the music. As composed by the earlier stated Hanzawa, alias Nan, the invigorating soundtrack is about as addictive as Crystal Meth, Kionichiban, Fluxatine, and Svetka combined. From the opening intro, all the way to the inclusive, diverse area of stage themes, ranging from valiant and sweeping to the most vehement and driving up-tempo tunes. Seriously, it even trumps the shit out of the likes of Taylor Swift and Justin Bieber. In fact, the less I say about either of them, the better, and are adequately beyond expectations, arranged in accordance with every appropriate juncture, regardless of its level of gravity. And shit, no, this is far from a goddamn thing to do with outer space. Anyways, my top six favorites. Now that's right, I'm bumping it up here, considering, of course, some songs are recycled in later intervals. Military on the Max Power, the Ancient Ruins theme, and in later stages. Pinky Rotor's theme, Defeat Pinky Rotor. Dancing Smash Hero, Orange's theme. Rolling Chaser, the Underground Minecart theme. Seven Forces theme. And finally, Last Party on the Moon, heard in the option screen, as well as the final area, the Empire HQ. Concerning the sound effects, apart from the sharp, if seldom out of proportion, voiceover samples, I'm left with no other alternative but to consider looking the other freaking way regarding everything else, despite how convincing and over the top they are. Replayability wise, feel free to refer back to what I mentioned about the fast paced gameplay schematics, the diverse choice of levels, and even the weapon fusion experiments. Aside from those redeeming factors, do as a whole to the unarmed combat strategies and attrition methods, boss patterns and appearances, the unexpected gameplay shift, or hell, if you're a full on running gun addict with a trigger happy craving, I would make every damned effort possible to sniff out Gunstar Heroes. Before I forget, there's a Japan-only Game Gear port of it by M2, in association with Treasure, no less. Which, notwithstanding its semi-broken nature due to the handheld limitations, if you're lucky, or god forbid ballsy enough, I strongly suggest tracking that down as well. And don't even get me started on the Game Boy Advance sequel released 12 years later, Gunstar Super Heroes, which, for the record, will also be given a last-minute honorable mention at the end.
Exhibit B, Dynamite Hetty, released the following year. So the plot set in the tranquil puppet village of Northtown comprised of various stage backgrounds, no less, within where our titular hero resides. One day, following a period of said tranquility, the infamous King Dark Demon, aka Smiley, wreaks all kinds of fucking havoc throughout, thanks to the work of his robo-collector henchmen, thus capturing Hetty in the process. Within minutes, he's rejected during a factory-inspired initiation to be converted into one of the King's henchmen. Hence, his raison d'etre boils down to thwarting the efforts of the Keymasters and Gatekeeper, which, by the way, has jack shit to do with Ghostbusters whatsoever, not to mention a jealous of puppet known as Trouble Bruin, aka Maruyama, and even the Nefarious King himself, before things get way the hell too out of hand. <laughs> As far as gameplay, what would one expect but another run-of-the-mill platforming gromp? In fact, scratch that shit! More like the reigning emperor of underrated platformers that deserves way more fucking attention than what was initially received. Hence this game's title and protagonist, you're stuck with diddly zulch by using your noggin to attack your foes, in a similar fashion to Chuck D. Head from Decap Attack, another Genesis Obscurity developed by Victor Kai, no less, or God forbid Jet Headstrong from the infamous Defenders of Dinatron City by JVC and LucasArts, via any one of the three available buttons, also used for jumping, and even a special ability to be mentioned, reaching higher places via living spheres known as Hangman, obtaining different head items from Headcase, which can be cancelled at any time, and during each boss confrontation, you're even aided by an angel puppet, Bo, not to be confused with, you know. In terms of mapping out its weak point, hence its one and only catchphrase. <laughs> Prior to meeting these three, however, we're introduced to a chase scene with numerous puppet inhabitants, who also got rejected just like Hetty did, as well as that very same Robo Dickwad from the intro sequence. Followed by a mono e mono duel with Trouble Bruin himself, who, despite the insurmountable damage his energy orbs provide, is a complete goddamn invertebrate, and in addition, you'll be running into this asshat in later scenes. The aforestated three, namely Hangman, Headcase, and Bow, are then seen in the next stage, found within their respective training centers, which can be optionally accessed or skipped. Hetty's life indicator is displayed via a stage light, likewise with the bosses he confronts throughout. As you and they take damage, the background color scheme dramatically changes while the first letter of his name, again, same spiel with his opposing boss, in said case, E for Enemy, gradually shrinks, initially from green, and then to yellow, orange, and finally red with some blinking black in between. Getting to the items that Hetty can obtain, aside from bananas for replenishing health, the differentiating heads he experiments with range from a vacuum head that sucks his foes and items up, and even an equal therapy head that allows the Big H to receive his brief share of shut eye for instant life recovery. Kirby much? An explosive head bomb used as a screen nuke, not to mention a variation of one where various explosions surround him, both a hammerhead and a spreadhead for beefing up Hetty's offensive capabilities, a machine gun head for firing random bullets in a Death Blossom like figure 8 pattern. Last Starfighter much? A spiked head for not only much improved damage proficiency, but also for wall grappling capabilities, one for shrinking in order to reach narrow diminutive areas, a head clock for freezing time in the style of Flashman and even Brightman for Mega Man 2 and 4 respectively, and even one for temporary invincibility, hence Hetty's predominantly thin white outlines, to name several of course. As beneficial as they are, the only head to avoid like Hurricane Sandy is the shit-all worthless heavyweight racist gender bender noggin. Unlike the other head power-ups I discussed so far, not only are you prevented from jumping or performing any attacks, it's non-cancelable, and should you happen to find yourself in a boss confrontation with just this particular liability, if I got a three-word news flash for you, consider yourself fucked. Unlike Gunstar Heroes, Dynamite Hetty's level setup and design is a rather enthralling one. Aside from the two introductory stages, other areas include various outskirts of North Town, an underground cave complete with a rotating 2.5 DZ axis platform, leading up to the castle of King Dark Demon himself, also complete with flying shmup stages slapped in between. It's kinda like the same deal as in Gunstar Heroes, except Hetty here takes on the form of a chicken, a biplane, and even a missile, all of which are split into acts, with some backstage settings also thrown in between, and not only adds to the involvement of branching paths, but mainly require the semi-mandatory use of the earlier discussed head weaponry to access these paths, thus once again beefing up the replayability to a rather substantial degree. And you gotta love those film puns, shown at the start of each of them. In addition to confronting and savagely tanning the hides of each boss, a key is then dropped from them, which Hetty's then new opposite sex compatriot Heather acquires in time upon her appearance, as well as a crap ton of tokens, the latter of which grants you will continue, you know, since you start off with none at all, likewise with the European version. Thank you. All with the exception of their Japanese counterpart, where you only start off with two. What the fuck, Sega and Treasure?
And while we're at it, the ladders may have to be much easier than the former two world versions, aside from the obvious design and gameplay alterations, which is where the next subject comes into it all. Concerning this game's controls, they're self-explanatory and far from a headache to grasp, notwithstanding how dormant they can become at certain intervals. Moreover, the gameplay schematics are provocative and well-balanced, and can take an abundant deal of time, patience, effort, and critical thinking to get accustomed to. No bones about that. As far as Dynamite Hedy's challenge, while it's obvious that the game kicks things off with a friendly welcome and gradually spikes the difficulty up the wazoo in later intervals, I wouldn't even go so damn far as to expect any mercy out of this hidden gem. Oh fuck no! Seriously, this game will slice off your liver, kidneys, and even your goddamn testicles, have them fed to the fucking wolves, and spat right back the hell out! Anyways, getting back to the bosses, aside from Trouble Bruin, and especially that Gimtard Robo Collector, others range from massive mechanical toys and nefarious puppet asswipes, who also want nothing more than to ensure that Hedy's efforts are shat upon at every turn, including Mad Dog, Wooden Dresser, who attacks and behaves in a similar fashion to Bravo Man from Gunstar Heroes, Motorhead and Mitsuru, otherwise known as these names displayed here, and even Twin Freaks, each of whose patterns are either essential to map out or flat out erratic as sin. Therefore, I suggest referring back to what I discussed about the confrontation setup. On top of it all, every other area will definitely jolt your senses into overdrive more effectively than the likes of Raiden, Pikachu, Electabuzz, Raichu, Zapdos, and even Electman and Sparkman combined. Take the auto-scrolling shmup stages, for instance. No matter which flight device form Hedy takes on, his torso is seen hanging from it, thus becoming an open target in the process. In other words, his ass is definitely on the line. Other than that, this aspect in and of itself is a rather invigorating change of pace. Oh, one other tidbit I forgot to mention. Upon scoring a Lady Liberty tiara, you're taken to a Big Apple-themed bonus stage where you have to, get this, score the required number of baskets in order to unlock both a secret arrangement of numbers and even a secret final boss confrontation slash ending. Randomized tangent warping aside, I'd be wary and cautious in each situation, especially when it comes to experimenting with the right head items, or you'll be definitely signing a hell of a lot more than just your death warrant. And bear in mind the tokens that you can acquire upon defeating each boss that grants you instant continues. In terms of graphics, Trish has really outdone themselves yet again with its stunning failsafe fulfillment of combined background and foreground animation and color hybrids. In addition to said multitude of visual fulfillments and effects, not only is Hedy himself a sight for sore ass size, likewise with his supporting and opposing character peers, all of which migrate at randomized yet vigorous paces, each and every idiosyncratic and screwball element discovered will definitely make you feel like you're in a Tex Avery meets the late Cecil B. DeMille macrocosm, all the way to the climactic as fuck finale, and to paraphrase IGN, talk about sensory overload all over again. My key point, phenomenal presentation is fucking phenomenal. Orchestrated yet again by Norio, aka Kazuo, this time around with Katsuhiko Suzuki, Koji Yamada, and Akihata, the uplifting and oftentimes quirky arrangement of scores are rather felicitous, given the assortment of backgrounds we're introduced to throughout, though few might end up being turned off by bits and pieces of it, except of course for yours truly. And at least it's not too fucking grating or ear rapey, unlike SNK Playmore's Athena, for instance. But here I am, yet again, getting way too goddamn ahead of myself. My top six tunes from this game alone are as follows. The opening theme, Escape Hero, heard both in the title screen and in the first stage. Hedy the Hero, North Town's theme, Dawn's in Dungeon, and of course, that's the way the boss is killed. As far as sound effects, they're a huge step forward for Treasure, notwithstanding the fact that they recycled the majority of them, if a few, from Gunstar Heroes. And to paraphrase Space Kappa Walker from the backlog, my honorable regards to him if he's watching this, it feels more like how the Wilhelm scream, not to mention the gut-wrenching, fall-in-the-distance Howie scream effect, is used in so many different movies. <laughs> And as ever, the voice samples don't disappoint by even a solitary iota. You've got a secret bonus point. Playability-wise, other than what I've indicated earlier regarding the use of head-based artillery tools and slew of endless branching terraces, to which, by this point, I cannot stress enough in reminding everyone to refer back, or god forbid, the customary abrupt as shit boss patterns, which add to the game's overall difficulty. Additionally, the countless batches of gags and kinks displayed throughout will definitely keep your ass coming back for more unlike no other. Therefore, if these platforms seen here ring a bell, and you've adored them to no foreseeable end for decades, you'd be absurd beyond logic to even ponder turning down the big DH. Alright, moving on to the final exhibit, and I'm dedicating this to Wiley, if he's watching this. No, not that Wiley. The Isometric RPG Light Crusader, released, yet be guessed it, the next year after. With a 
plot taking place during medieval times, it revolves around a swordsman dauntlessly serving King Frederick, namely Sir David, being promised a vacation in Green Row after a long, arduous pilgrimage. Upon his long-awaited return, however, he instantly ascertains that most of the townspeople are in a state of irreversible trepidation. He then makes his way to the local palace, and according to King Whedon, the majority of Green Row's population, with the obvious exception of those same clueless, dismayed survivors, have been banished to even the most perplexing degree imaginable due to some Fubar's Ball's magic curse. Now, it's up to the indefatigable efforts and unmatched fortitude of David to get down to the bottom of all this pandemonium before things get way the fuck too out of hand. In civil frankness, unlike most RPGs out there, Light Crusader is rather lacking in the depth department thanks to its semi-stale, albeit convincing, backstory. And before I forget, the root of the problem, not to mention the main antagonist wizard shown at the beginning, is known as Ragnarok, who intends to lay his vengeance upon all humankind by resurrecting a dark demon known as Ramaya, following the denial of his marriage proposal by the Queen. Mounting our noses to the grindstone with the gameplay aspect, as indicated before, this is a top-view isometric action puzzle RPG in the style of Climax's Land Stalker and Lady Stalker, published by Sega and Taito respectively. Or better yet, what if Solstice by CSG ImageSoft and Software Creations and Actraiser by Square Enix and Quintet had a baby? Yeah, somewhere along that line. In which you assume the role of our balanced adventurer slash gladiator, guiding him from one area to another throughout Green Row, conversing and interacting with townsfolk, creatures, and foreground elements, and later exploring various dungeon chambers in order to lift that horrendous, life-threatening curse of rogues. Starting with 200 gold, which, like most RPGs out there, you know, like the rupees in Zelda, also the gold and later gill in Final Fantasy, what have you, I highly advise spending wisely. David can purchase helpful items or acquire them from chests, the latter of which are found in dungeons, ranging from potions, a pendant that automatically heals him in case he gets slain in any form, same spiel with various foods and beverages that restore his health, or in some cases, rid him of poison. Seriously, we're not going there! Standard to advanced weaponry and armor, and here's the big gamebreaker, various magic incantations based on the four core elements, similar to, say, the likes of Mystic Defender or Jewel Master. Fire, air, earth, and water, all of which in true Gunstar Heroes and Super Metroid fashion can be fused with each other in doubles, triples, or quintuples, allowing for various effects. Now take note, neither required magic points to cast any of them, in addition to David's basic 8-way movement system, buttons A, B, and C allow him to cast his desired incantation, attack with his sword, as well as talk or cancel, and jump respectively, while A and C are also used for confirming things aside from their main assigned actions. He can even perform a diving thrust or aerial slash via B and C simultaneously or in variable time constraints depending on which key is pushed first. Since the entire game takes place in the earlier cited isometric bird's eye view, and this is my final reiteration, the most common gripe that many will suffer from this game, or still do even to this day, along with other issues I intend to elaborate upon as this transpires, is the jump positioning, which is why I highly encourage keeping a close eye on David's shadow while attempting to clear each foreseeable gap. Should you happen to botch up the positioning at any instant, you gotta start the entire run through from scratch, considering his falls won't result in any deaths whatsoever, except for the fucking spikes and bombs, amongst many hazards you'll confront throughout, which pack some serious wallops. In terms of the combat system, whether it's via your sword or magic, it's relatively straightforward and works quite adequately. It's basically a matter of pinpointing which direction your foes face and adjusting your trajectory accordingly while slaying their menacing asses, while most enemies, including slime, skeletons, ogres, living foliage, and the like, leave absolute shit all. Others leave behind either random nourishment for your health, more gold pieces, or keys needed for unlocked doors. Within each dungeon area, comprised of countless floors ranging in size, aside from countering numerous foes and bosses to eventually level David up, and even freeing the captive townsfolk, you'll end up spending the majority of your time solving even the trickiest mind-raping puzzles to access later areas, which you'll have to execute repeatedly every time you leave a certain room, since upon doing so, they always end up resetting. Or should you happen to fuck up at a moment's notice? Talk about laborious. And before anyone asks, yes, you can actually sell things to cats. Random, right? Getting to the inventory screen, which can be accessed by pausing, in addition to David's current status, in terms of his health count, duration of play, and even how much gold he's carrying currency-wise, the aforestated assortment of nourishment and beverages are shown, which can, once again, be used for auto mode. Not to mention your main weapon and armor equipment, as well as various key items and relics found throughout. And there's even a map function to pinpoint your current location, whether you're within the outskirts of the Green Row Village or the numerous dungeon areas, the latter of which can be accessed depending on your desired floor. David can also visit pups to socialize with the drunkards about certain clues and even purchase refreshments. Stay for a night at the Green Row Inn for 10 gold to replenish his health, as well as to purchase the aforementioned magic incantation capsules. But the most important source to consult is the Oracle, via the King's Advisor, since every clue offered, in terms of which steps to take next, are far from vague and baffling. 
Depending on whether or not you've already obtained a pendant, wasting the majority of your health not only results in an instant death, a game over declaration thus ensues, at which point you can continue from where you last saved and or died, or end the quest altogether. As for the overall control schematics, they're self-explanatory, notwithstanding for the sake of sniffing out any nail-on-the-head gripes, how jittery the horizontal strolling, or how out of proportion the jump positioning and aerial strikes can become at times. Likewise with the unambiguous gameplay aspect, thanks as a whole to the exhilarating beyond belief freedom it provides. As far as challenge, please refer back to the multitude of common gripes regarding the puzzle prerequisites, magic spell usage, and jump sequence timing and positioning, since they fully intend to avoid any conception of redundancy. Additionally, the collision and hit detection during each enemy and boss confrontation can be a huge pain in the testicles, especially the latter, which as somewhat deceptively cakewalkish as the first few turn out to be, later ones can be outright daunting depending on your approaches. My only word of advice is to be completely exact in not only inflicting as much damage as possible, but predominantly in maintaining a steady balance between that and exercising your evasive approaches in the long run. Zelda much? On a few other hints I neglected to indicate, should you find yourself wary at any point, most of the dungeon areas have healing fountains to restore your health to full. During certain incidents, you can even disguise yourself as a random foe, Mission Impossible style, to bypass all the rest. And there's even save points, few and far between as they are, to keep your progress in check should you feel the need to continue your excursion later, hence the built-in battery backup feature. As always, take note, it can go to waste depending on its lifespan, resulting in your progress to be reset to absolute shit. In summation, considering how the difficulty isn't as brutal as other RPGs of decades past, no matter how far you advance, only your tenacity, ingenuity, and willpower are your only reliable side-by-side -side life partners. Otherwise, paraphrasing the infamous Batman Forever, you'd be bruised, broken, bleeding, and or dead. More like bruised, broken, bleeding, and a more elaborated fate, ruthlessly slaughtered like a flock of fucking sheep. In terms of graphics and visuals, for a Genesis RPG released late in its lifespan, not to mention the same year as Comic Zone, Vector Man, Earthworm Jim 2, Echo Jr., Beyond Oasis, Weapon Lord, VR Troopers, Garfield Con the Act, Revolution X, Gargoyles, Marsupilami, Separation Anxiety, Exo Squad, Mega Swift, aka what I like to call the Special Firepower 2000 Genesis Edition, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers the Movie, and others. They're a mixed bag of sorts, and definitely not the shitty grotesque kind. Considering Treasure's departure from the traditional anime themes in order to aim for a more western influence style, every isometric background and foreground element displayed is rather eye-catching, albeit a trifle dismal, and the sprites of not only David himself, but most of the supporting townsfolk and creatures, which for the sake of humor, if for no other purpose whatsoever, can be easily and literally pushed around like with the labyrinth puzzles, as well as opposing adversaries, the whole nine, are somewhat lively despite their stagnant behavior. I suppose the designers were also going for a more realistic approach, physique-wise? Sure, there are some inadequate elements that they could have improved upon more, but at least the labyrinth areas have been given distinct separate facelifts, and the collegial elements aren't too much of a goddamn eyesore, thanks to the pre-rendered 3D effects that they offer, predating the infamous Sonic 3D Blast by a year. I mean, honestly, need I go the hell any further? Musically, along with the sound effects, composed this time around by Akihata, the diverse arrangement of orchestrations range from morose and dreary to optimistic, calming, and other times vehement, depending on which part of the game David's involved in, no less. Despite not being regarded as the best 16-bit Genesis soundtrack, it's considered to be rather satisfying and appropriate, especially for its age. And take note of my top 6 favorites shown here. Concerning the latter, directed and engineered by Katsuhiko Suzuki, alias Nazo Nazo, and Satoshi Murata, respectively, while everything else just flat-out screams mediocrity and a half, and missing the on-screen activity by more than half the length of a panther's whisker, the traditional voice samples are far from a vexatious drag, not counting David's grunts. Like, listen to these, for example. Answer the riddle. Beat them. They're gonna kill you. Hell, every Genesis hit during its heyday had some killer voice samples, but those contained throughout pretty much take the quadruple decker red velvet cheesecake, that's for sure. While in civil fairness, there's barely any replay value at all due to the lack of extra side quests or activities, not to mention extra content, including difficulty spikes and such, the entire game in and of itself is relatively short, even for an action RPG puzzle hybrid no less, that the average duration of completing it should estimate to approximately 1.5 to 4 hours tops. Merciful as I am here, should you happen to find yourself able to get around the archaic-ass puzzle-solving prerequisites, platforming obstacle dilemmas, or god forbid the semi-awkward enemy confrontation and attrition methods, and in addition, if you enjoyed the likes of these two RPGs seen here, I don't foresee any explicit impetus to even consider leaving Light Crusader out in the goddamn cold. Therefore, what's our final verdict on Treasure's Triple Threat of Classics? At this juncture, there isn't much more to express further that hasn't already been about them. In their respective cases, if you've endlessly relished the likes of their worthy competitors, you owe it to yourself to give each of them a serious jolt or two, shit if way more. 
As usual, for any and all next-gen addicts out there, they're available on not only the Virtual Console, but also on Steam, Cloud, PS Network, Xbox Live Arcade, Apple iOS, and even the Japan-only Treasure Box collection on PS2. I assure you, pun may be intended, surprisingly enough. You will treasure these titles for generations and generations, or did I mention generations to come? Same situation with what's displayed in my usual epilogue of an honorable mention lineup. Until then, my faithful viewers, this is the Hardcore Retro God, proudly signing off.